I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. Welcome to the Cloud Church and our Bible study as we go verse by verse through the scriptures, through the epistles of Paul, in order of when they were written. We are in 1 Thessalonians now, chapter 5, and we got all the way to verse 14. We finished up with verse 13, which says, To esteem very highly in love for their work's sake. It's talking about those that are over you in the Lord in verse 12. And we're to esteem them. Who is that? Spiritual leaders, pastors, and deacons, and evangelists, those that led you to the Lord, Bible teachers. Esteem them for their work's sake. So, are they working correctly for the Lord? Well, there are some people the Bible calls hirelings, and they're just in it for the money. I don't think we should esteem them. But then there are those who are Christians who love the Lord, who are truly studying the Scriptures and working hard to try to give you as much Bible as they can and to teach you. And the context that we looked at last time was to comfort you and to edify you. That's what a minister is supposed to do and what he's supposed to be is someone who edifies and someone who comforts. And we looked at the work of a minister is supposed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> so if you're uh, afflicted, well, he's to comfort you with the scriptures and try to build you up and edify you. But if you're backslidden and, and, and living like the devil and doing wrong, then he needs to afflict you so you're not comfortable in your sins. So now we come to verse 14. It says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them, <coughs> oh, excuse me, <coughs> still kind of getting over this cold. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Oh no, who are the unruly? Well, last time we talked a little bit about these unruly. Who are the unruly? Well, I talked to you last time about how in churches there's church splits because there's people who are carnal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we looked at babes in Christ. And Paul said, I cannot speak unto you as to spiritual, but you're carnal. So you will always have in a church bad people. Jesus Christ had 12 disciples, and one of them was a devil. <laughs> so there were only 11 good ones. So every church is going to have somebody bad in it. I've got a track over here by Bob Jones. If you know who Bob Jones was, he was a famous preacher from the you know, 30s and 40s and all that. And started some Bible school out in South Carolina. And in this track, it's actually a message that he preached. And he said in 1940-something, he said, I don't believe that even 50% of all the people in the churches that I've preached to are even saved. <laughs> One thing to say, and he said that in like 1940-something. I don't know, 46 or somewhere around there. It was 1940-something. And that was in his day. I wonder what that is today in churches. I wonder how many people that sit in actual church pews are really, truly saved. How do you get saved? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel, Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again a third day according to the scriptures. It's all about what he did. And what happens when you get unruly, carnal people? It's all about them. I've seen churches split. I've been in church splits. I think one time I... I started a church split. I hope not, but it kind of seems like it from bits and pieces that I heard later. It wasn't something bad that we did. It's just I preached a gospel, and it made some people angry and other people happy. And I kind of think it split the church. But um, there are carnal people in churches, and what should we do? Well, we should do right. Why are they carnal? Because they make it all about them. A guy said one time, he said, in your heart there's a cross and there's a throne. He said, and this isn't Bible, this isn't doctrine or whatever, but it's an interesting thought. You know, let's, let's pretend that this is a throne. that will look like one. He said, if Jesus is on the cross, he said, then you're sitting on the throne. And he tried to say that you're the one that's trying to run your life and you're doing it your way, so you're selfish, you're carnal. He said, but if Jesus is on the throne and then it's you on the cross then you're walking in the Spirit. You know, that, that makes kind of a lot of sense. I know that's not Bible doctrine, if you will, but it makes sense. In your life, if you're carnal, it's because you're wanting to sit on the throne and put Jesus back on the cross. But if you're living a righteous life, you're putting down the flesh, you're on the cross, and Jesus is on the throne. So the reason that we have people who walk unruly the reason we have people that are doing wrong in the churches and, and are mean and hateful and, and like we talked about last time, all they want to do is name call and put down and, and mock and ridicule, it's because they're carnal. 
is because they're walking in the flesh and not the spirit. Someone once said, the word flesh backwards is self, if you take off the H. I don't know if that means anything, but it is interesting. The people that put others down, it's because they're selfish. Because last time we learned we're supposed to esteem others better than ourselves. If I esteem someone better than myself, then I don't walk in the flesh. I don't say, me, 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 first. You see, the flesh says, me first, you maybe, next, or possibly, or maybe. The flesh says, me first, and the flesh is all about me, me, me. But the Christian life is all about Jesus, 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 and it's not you. Uh, John the Baptist came, and when John the Baptist came, what did he say? He's talking about Jesus. He said, he must increase, and I must decrease. That's the Christian life. Put the flesh down. I need to decrease. I need God. I need the Spirit of God to increase. I need to follow God and live for Him instead of living for myself. So, last time was a little bit of fun. We looked at uh, how we're supposed to esteem others more than ourselves, verse 13, especially those that are ministers that work for the sake of the Lord, and uh, how we should be at peace with others. And now we come to verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded. So, these people, these unruly really people, we need to warn them. What should we warn them about? Well, if you're one of those unruly people, watch out. Because God is watching. You reap what you sow. You're mean to others, it's going to come back on you. you. You do bad to others, it's going to come back on you. So, be warned if you're one of those people. I tried to warn you last week, don't be like that. Don't walk in the flesh, but walk in the Spirit. And the big word we used last week was edify. And we looked at what edify means. And edify means, if I can find it, to build, to instruct, to improve, uh, particularly in moral and religious knowledge and faith and holiness. To persuade, and I tried to persuade you and warn you, don't be unruly, don't be carnal, don't be mean and hateful. Walk in the Spirit, don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, and live at peace with all men, esteem others higher than yourselves. So, now we're going to look at the word today, exhort. I like, the, I like the Bible words. You know, a lot of times you think you know what a word means, and it's good to look it up in the Webster's 1868 Dictionary. So I looked up edify, and I learned it means to build up. I thought it just means to teach something. Well, it means that too, but it's to try to help people to grow in the Lord. So now, today, we're going to look at exhort. So look at the word uh, in, in verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. So exhort, what does exhort mean? The 1828 Webster's Dictionary, exhort means to encourage, to incite by words or advice, to urge by arguments or deed, to warn, to caution, to advise. So here we have the word warn. And it's interesting, now we exhort you, brethren, warn them. Well, exhort and warn are synonyms, synonyms and they're used together in the same passage in verse 14. So, the word exhort is used 16 times in the King James Bible. Now, it's used other times in the ING form in the past tense. I didn't look that up, but just exhort like that is 16 times in the King James Bible. And I'm not going to look at every verse, but I would like to look at some. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Just turn back one, one chapter and verse 1. Paul says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. So he's saying, I, I try to advise you, I try to urge you, I try to ask you to do what? To walk. Well, part of the definition of exhort is to incite by words or advice, to urge by arguments or deed. And his deed was he walked a certain way, and he was exhorting us to walk correctly. And how are we supposed to walk? Well, we took a long time on one course, and I gave you a list of verses of how we as a Christian should walk. And basically, we should walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, not carnal. Because carnality leads to meanness, and mean-spirited hatefulness, and, and silliness, name-calling, and and mocking, and getting in the flesh, and, and hurting others, and putting them down, when exhorting, I mean edifying, is to build them and lift them up. And that's what we should do. That's what I'm trying to do through these teachings, verse by verse, if you're a Christian, to build you up in the faith. 
I'm not interested in self-esteem, okay? There is a teaching today, self-esteem, where you go to a secular school, they say, oh, we got to instill in him self-esteem. What is self-esteem? It's making you think you're better than others. Making you feel like you're worth something, that you're good. Well, the Bible says there are none of the good, no, not one. And the Bible says we're to esteem others more highly than ourselves. Well, self-esteem is the exact opposite. Try to make yourself feel like that you're higher than others. So everything you learn in a secular school is against the Bible. There's no self-esteem in the Bible. It's esteeming others more highly than yourself. Interesting. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.1. And 1 Timothy 2.1 says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So he says, I'm urging you, I'm advising you to pray for others. So one of the things that he exhorts of us is to pray for others. Another thing he exhorted was that we esteem others more highly than ourselves. So there's some things that, that he exhorts for us to do. 1 Timothy 6, 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved. Partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. So what are we supposed to do? Serve others. So, he exhorts you to serve other people. Hmm. Do you do that? It's kind of hard to serve other people when you're name-calling, mocking, and ridiculing, and putting them down and saying dirty things about them, isn't it? If you really want to be a Christian, you need to realize what it is to be a Christian. It's to esteem others more highly than yourselves. It's to have charity towards others. And it basically is to serve them. You know what Jesus did one time? He got a pot, uh, a pot of water and a towel, and he went to each one of the twelve disciples, even to Judas, one of the bad ones, and he washed their feet. Let me ask you something. You people that say you're a minister, and that yet you like to put people down all the time, be mean, have you ever done that? Would you ever do that? Would you ever bend down and take someone's dirty socks off? and wash their dirty, stinky feet. I tell you, that's humbling. That really shows you what it means to be uh, um, esteeming others more highly than yourselves. I've, we don't do foot washing nowadays. In the, Old Test in the Old Testament they did. Jesus did it. And in the New Testament they practiced it. But we don't do that nowadays. That's something very foreign to us today, to actually clean somebody else's feet. That's gross. And why don't we do that? Well, because most people live in a house where they have a bathtub or a shower and they clean themselves. But in the old days there weren't any showers. So in the old days you go to someone's house and there was a thing called hospitality. That means if you went to stay at someone's house they served you. They wanted you to come to their house. They enjoyed helping people. And you've been walking all day and your feet are all dirty. You've got dirt between your toes from your sandals. And they would actually say sit down let me clean your feet. And they would do that, and they would show other people, Hey, man, I care about you. Let me help you out. Boy, that's humbling. And I've never cleaned someone's feet, but I've had it done to me one time. I went and stayed at a house of another Christian. He said, Brother, I want to clean your feet. And I was like, uh, I don't know. That's kind of, huh, uh And he did. And I was just like, the whole time, I was just sitting there going, Oh, I don't like this. Oh, please don't do this. I mean, it made you feel really low because it showed somebody cared enough about you to do something for you. And, and it's, it's kind of humiliating. And it helps you. He's esteeming me more highly than myself, because he wants to do that. And I'm esteeming him more highly than myself, because he's doing something that I don't know if I could do to somebody else. <laughs> so, humility is so important. And there's so many ministers today that aren't humble. And they need to be humble. Let's go to Titus chapter 1. Humility is part of being a Christian. The Bible says that Jesus humbled himself and went to the cross. You want to be a follower of Christ? You got any humility? Esteem others higher than yourself? Put the flesh down like Jesus did? Titus 1.9 Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he might be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainseers. So what do we do with exhortation? We exhort by teaching doctrine. Out of room. 
So, exhortation is by showing doctrine. What is doctrine? Bible teachings. Let's don't teach what we think or we feel or what we think the Bible should say. What does the Bible say? Let's just look at it and show others what it says. Titus 2.6 Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. We just keep coming back to that word so often, sober. And we saw in our other teaching that it has two different meanings. It means to be alert, to be awake. It also means to be not drunk with wine. And as a Christian, we need to stay away from drunkenness. Because it can lead to one of three things. Nakedness, fornication, or fighting. Oh, fighting. 2.9. Titus 2.9, exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. So, to exhort what? To exhort to please others. We should try to please others. And we don't let others walk all over us. I've known people that they cannot say no. And you go to them, they'll do anything for you. I mean, just about anything. They cannot say no. And a lot of people see that, and they take advantage of a person like that. I know a guy right now I'm thinking of, I have in mind. He can't say no, and people take advantage of him. Well, he just wants to please others. But you shouldn't get to the point where you let people walk all over you, poor guy. But we should think others of our, others before we think of ourselves. Um, Titus chapter 2 and verse 15, he said, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So there's some things, if it's scripture and if it's doctrine and we know it's true and it's not our opinion, we can speak and exhort and rebuke and this is our authority. You know, when a guy marries somebody, uh, usually the minister says, with the authority vested in me by the power of God, I declare you man and wife. <laughs> That's interesting. It's something he says, this is the authority that allows me to do that. Let's get Hebrews. We're just looking up verses that talk about the word exhort. Hebrews 3.13 Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says, But exhort one another daily when it is called today, lest any of you have an unbelieving heart. I lost my verse. 3.13 But exhort every, one another daily when it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hmm. Exhort one another daily. Okay. What is another verse? 10.25. Looking up the verse... Uh, talks about exhorting. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we should exhort each other to to assemble or come together for church service. Exhort people, hey man, go to church. It's not that good of a thing to get out of church. Going to church is wonderful. It's fun because you fellowship with other Christians. I know it's getting harder and harder today though to find a good church. But there's no such thing as a perfect church. But that doesn't mean you have an excuse to stay home. Uh, Jude 1.3 says, Brethren, excuse me, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We should exhort others to what? Contend for the faith. What does that mean? That means preach the gospel. I want to exhort you, urge you to preach 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Have you taken that verse and opened it up and showed it to lost people lately? Give people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. 1 Peter 5, 5 12 says, By Sylvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. So, he exhorted the grace of God. So, we need to exhort people to have grace. A lot of Christians don't even know what grace is. At least they claim to be Christians, but they have no grace whatsoever. So, continuing on, here we go to 1 Thessalonians again. In chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. 5.14, I put my note away too soon. Where did it go? 5.14. Okay, I guess I'm good. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 says, 
Now exhort your brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded. We talked about um, to warn is to exhort, so warn them that are wrong. Comfort them that are feeble-minded, so to comfort is something important. Uh, support the weak, what does that mean? It means we help them. And be patient toward all men. What does the Bible say about patience? I don't want to go through all the verses on patience and being patient. But it does, it would be good to look at a couple verses that the Bible talk about being patient. So, 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says, Not given to wine, not striker, not guilty of fil filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetousness. It's talking about a bishop or a pastor. A pastor should be patient. I've met some pastors in my life that weren't very patient. <laughs> Patience is a virtue, we say. 2 Timothy 2.24, what does it say? And the servant of the Lord must, be, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Patient. Christians should be patient, but also ministers should be patient. James chapter 5, verse 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband will wait for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Verse 8 says, Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So we as Christians should be patient of some things. Now let's look at verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So we should never render evil unto evil. And yet there are some Christians who want to be evil. Uh, I've met Christians that say, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to get you back. <laughs> well, that's not the Christian way. That's not what God wants. See, I know a verse here, if I can find it, where it talks about rendering evil. I believe it's in Romans. Let me look that up. Going to Romans chapter 2 and verse 6. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasure up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So here it's talking about people that aren't saved. And God says he will render unto certain people their deeds. So we read this verse that says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man. So it is not for us to render to others what they've done to us. In other words, the word um, revenge, excuse me, revenge. We as Christians should not seek to revenge someone. Someone does us wrong, we shouldn't want to do wrong back to them. Um, let me get that verse for you. Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. <coughs> uh, actually, let's go to Romans 12, 17. Actually, let's go to Romans 12, 16. <laughs> Actually, let's go. Okay, let's just go to Romans chapter 12. <laughs> this kind of ties everything together with what we're actually saying about comforting, about being at peace with one another, and comforting and, and exhorting. Romans chapter 12 says, and I want to start reading in verse, well, verse 10. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Well, there we go. Esteeming others higher than yourself. Preferring one another. So putting another as above yourself. With brotherly kindness, brotherly love. Love each other. Don't put each other down and attack and call names and be mean. It says, not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient. All right, we just looked at patience. Patient, it says, in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. We should exhort each other to what? Pray for one another. It says, distributing to the necessity of the saints. Well, we just read about supporting the weak. You see, in the Bible, and this is something that is not practiced today, at least not in any church I've been in, hardly, is when Paul went out as a missionary, Paul went out, and Paul preached and started churches. Do you know Paul never asked those churches for support? Most missionaries today ask churches, oh, send me money. So say, send money to the missionary. And he says, oh, send me money so I can do the work of the Lord. Paul went out. Paul worked his own. He built his tents. And when Paul went to churches, he went to those churches. He did ask for offerings. But those offerings that Paul took up, you know who he gave to? He gave to saints that were poor. 
That's other Christians. And Paul took that money, he gave it to the poor saints in Jerusalem. The early church helped other Christians. I've never seen that done today. There's a big church, a big push in churches to give to missionaries, which is fine. Let's help missions. Missions are supposed to take the gospel to the lost. They've set up what a lot of churches call faith promise. And they say, give your faith promise to give to missions. But where is the offering in the church for the poor Christians who can't make their bills that month? Where? And see, that goes back to what we read in 1 Thessalonians about getting to know one another. If the pastor knows the people and the people know the pastor, then the pastor will know, hey, this family's struggling. They had a sickness and they can't afford to pay the doctor bills. Or they had a baby and they can't afford the bill. Or they're going through some things and the church could help by taking up an offering for that poor saint. This is something that's lacking today. I can foresee it being abused too. You know, if a pastor likes one family more than another, he might try to get offerings taken up and help that family above others, which would be wrong. But, you know, in the church, when it started, Paul was helping the poor saints. It's interesting how things are so different to this day. But we are looking at uh, Romans chapter 10, excuse me, Romans chapter 12. And look what it says in verse 7. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, teaching, excuse me, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And then we read verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints. That's what Paul was doing. He was helping saints that needed it. Given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them with, that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. <clears throat> Be not wise in your own conceit. So, consent. So we're supposed to esteem others higher than ourselves. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Alright, we read that in, in 1 Thessalonians. We'll go back to it. Render not evil for evil. Um, how did it go? Render not. I got it right here. He says, see that none render evil for evil unto any man. Well, here it is in verse 17 of Romans 12. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And then verse 18, which we read earlier, about being peace, peaceably, living peaceably. If it be possible, as much as life within you, live peaceably with all men. Dear the beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So, revenge. We as Christians should not try to revenge other people. God is the one who gets revenge. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So don't render evil to evil. Don't try to revenge others. Verse 20, Therefore if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So if someone does evil to you, you do good back. And the Bible says when you do that, you'll be heaping coals of fire on their head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a passage over in, in, um, in Matthew. So if you have your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22. Oh no, I lost it. Uh, sometimes I look it up in my Bible, sometimes I look it up in, in the computer, and every now and then I make a wrong click. It's, it's almost faster to find things in the Bible uh, than it is to go to the computer. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, it says, Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now Jesus is speaking, and look what he says in, in verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Wow. So, the instinct that we have in the flesh is when someone does me bad, I want to do it back. But the Bible tells me, don't render evil for evil. The Bible tells me not to do a revenge, because God will avenge. He said, I will repay. The Bible says here to bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you. So when someone does me wrong, I do them right by doing right to them back. That will hurt them more than if I did something bad back to them. Because if the person has a conscience, they'll feel bad about what I did. If they don't, they won't. But that's the way that God wants it to be. That's what God wants Christians to do is to do right 
and to be nice and not be evil. Now this is important. It goes along with what we looked at either last time or the time before about how many Christians there are that are mean-spirited and hateful and name-call and ridicule and use sarcasm and make fun of others. You know, you don't have to do that back. But the flesh wants to. Uh, somebody calls you a name, you want to call the name back. That's the flesh. All you should do is go, well, thank you, brother. I appreciate you calling me that. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good one, man. Thank you for putting me down, putting me in my place. I appreciate that. Boy, I tell you what, I didn't know I was as, I was such a dirty dog as you say I am. You know, I mean, that'll hurt somebody more than you calling them a name. You see, they're provoking you. They want you to say something awful because they want to feel good about themselves. And so they try to put you down, and then when you fight back, they say, ah, you're just what I thought you were. You're just one of those people that calls names, ha ha, even though they're doing it themselves. There's actually a word for that. What people accuse you of is usually what they're guilty of. And in, in psychology, there's a word for that. Transference. I don't know. Transference. I don't know if you ever heard of transference, and I probably spelled it wrong. But transference means someone is guilty of something, and then they accuse you of the very thing that they're guilty of even though you haven't done it. <laughs> and the reason they do that is, deep down inside, they feel bad about it, but as long as somebody else is doing it, then they don't feel so bad. So let's say somebody's a fornicator, and they don't like you, and they want people to hate you, so the first thing they'll do is say, oh, you're a fornicator, and start calling you a fornicator. And you're not. And you're like, why is he calling me this? Well, later, it comes out that he was. Well, he called you the very thing that he was guilty of because he was trying transference. He was trying to make you guilty. <laughs> About the best example in the Bible is in uh, chapter 8 of the book of John. And in John chapter 8, they bring to Jesus a woman taken in adultery. <laughs> and in Romans chapter 8, they bring this woman taken in adultery and say, Look, Jesus, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. And... Uh, you know, and they, and they say, you know, here she is. Now, Moses and the law commanded us that we should stone her. Or what do you say? And the Bible says, well, Jesus stooped down and rode on the dirt. And then he stood up, and each one, from the oldest to the youngest, walked away. The question begs to be asked, who is the one committing adultery with her? Because in the law, both of them were to be stoned, the man and the woman. As you had a bunch of men that were bringing a woman and say, Kill her! Kill her! She's a dirty, low-down, sorry adulteress! And Jesus didn't even look at them, just wrote something in the law. He probably, I wrote something on the ground, he probably wrote in the law, stone them both. Because <laughs> Jesus knew it was probably one of them that was adulterating with her. But yet, they wanted to call her the adulterer when they were guilty of it. Or, maybe they found her and the man ran away. And they just kept the woman, and none of them were guilty of adultery. Well, they were guilty of adultery, spiritually, because they were going against the law, and against the truth, and against the gospel. But people will always accuse you of something that you haven't done, often. And usually it's because they're the one themselves that have done it. Do we render evil for evil? Do we play their little game, and they call you a name, or put you down, or say something, and say, you've got to do it back? Or we just go, no thanks, I don't want to play that. God is watching. I know the truth. You have a nice day. God bless you. Because God says we bless them and we heap coals of fire on their head. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. See that you render, that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Oh, by the way, that all men means among yourselves is Christians and all men is lost people. So this goes not only to Christians, this is the lost world. If a lost person does something hateful and mean and evil to you, as a Christian, you don't have a right to do that back. Especially as a Christian, because if you do, then he'll have even more to say against you and say, that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. Now, verse 16 says, rejoice evermore. Philippians 4.4 4 says, cross-reference, Philippians 4.4 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. It is amazing to me how many times Paul says rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. We should rejoice in the Lord. We should be happy and happy. Christians should be happy. Christians should not walk around in the dumps. The Bible says, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. 
Um, let me see. There's a verse that says. Let me see if I can find that verse. I know it's in Colossians. Here it is. Colossians chapter three and verse six at uh, verse fifteen. Colossians three fifteen is one of my favorite verses. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. <laughs> Be ye thankful, verse 15. Those are some amazing words. Some of the best verses in the Bible are very short. Rejoice evermore. That's two words. Or is it three? No, they put evermore together in the King James Bible. That's one Bible verse, and there's just two words. The next one is only three words. Pray without ceasing. So, verse 16 is one of the shortest verses in the entire Bible. Rejoice evermore. In John, we have Jesus wept. People say the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Well, for word-wise, it is. But it's only two words. Verse 16 is also just two words. But then we look at Colossians 3.15. It says, Be ye thankful. Just three words. Of course, there's a lot more in that verse. But rejoice. It's easy to rejoice when you're thankful. Why did I go to that verse and say, well, thankfulness is what makes us rejoice. Count your blessings. The old saying is, if you, uh, I thought someone's here. If someone, the old saying is, if someone uh, gets in the dumps, they need to, to count their blessings on all ten fingers. Start thinking about all the things that God's done for you. And it's hard to be in the dumps when you count up everything God's done for you. Well, if you're thankful, then you'll be rejoicing. The people that don't rejoice are the unthankful people. We need to always remember, be ye thankful. Verse 7, 17, pray without ceasing. Now, verse 18 goes with, be ye thankful. All right? Verse 18 says, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, what is God's will for us? Give thanks. This is the will of God. We looked at some of the wills of God already, back here in 1 Thessalonians 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Excuse me. 4 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And we looked at some of the things that the Bible call the will of God. Well, here, the will of God is be thankful. It is the will of God concerning you. So, this is so important thankfulness. We just had Thanksgiving here last month. This is December 2014, as I give this and speak. We as an entire nation in America set aside one day to be thankful. That's amazing. No other nation on earth celebrates Thanksgiving. But you know what's amazing to me? The next day is Black Friday. What is Black Friday about? It's all about saving money and buying things. And it's all about getting the deal. And it's all about the flesh. It's all about something that you can get and it's probably the most unthankful day of the year <laughs> because you're running around trying to get something and everybody's angry because they want to beat each other and I want to get it before this person and oh, I can't wait to get this and it's it's lust and it's I want and I want and it's wanting this and it's like the exact opposite of the day before <laughs> Black Friday what, what a shame but in the Bible we should be thankful what are you thankful for do you have some things to be thankful for verse 19 says quench not the spirit Quench not the Spirit. Now let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 tells us, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. We're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're not supposed to quench the Holy Spirit. In other words, if we're walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh, we don't have to worry about that. But oftentimes in the flesh, when we're carnal and we're doing wrong, oftentimes we... We thwart what God wanted done. There's often times that we can do something and God set something up for us to do. And if we're walking in the Spirit, He'll direct us directly to that. But if we're walking in the flesh, we can quench His Spirit. We can quench what He wants done. Verse 20 says, Despise not prophesying. In the early church, there were some prophecies. But the prophecies have ceased. There's no more prophesying. The Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Let me find that verse for you. That means now that the church age is, is almost to the end, all the prophesying is done. 2 Peter 1.19 If 
If you have a Bible, go to 2 Peter 1.19. This is so important because there are people alive today that claim to be prophets. And they start, oh, I'm prophesying through the Spirit. And if you look at them, every one of them eventually says something that's against the Bible. And yet they claim to be speaking for God. No, 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 no. This is our prophecy. In 2 Peter 1, um, verse 19, let's, let's start at verse 19. 2 Peter 1, 19 says, For we also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. So we have a more sure word of prophecy, the King James Bible. More sure than if some man just stood up and said, The Lord says, da, da, da. I'm going to take this and see if he says it's right or not. I'm not going to take that over this. This is the word of prophecy. Verse 20 says, Knowing that this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For this prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, we are no longer... Um, under prophecy. So the prophecies are past and today the prophecies that we need is the King James Bible. 1 Corinthians 13.8 tells us this. Go to 1 Corinthians 13.8. I had to look at my computer real quick. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 13.8. Watch this. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies they shall fail. Hmm. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So, the, the Bible, and I'll have to go ahead and erase this. Of course, i got other things I need to put up here anyway, so I'm going to have to erase it eventually. But, as we look through the scriptures, and we've told this before, and if you haven't seen this, go to the, the front of the cloudchurch.org and look up Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. But when Jesus Christ showed up, here's his earthly ministry, his birth was here. After Jesus Christ died, the church began to start. And as the church started, it started with the apostles. And then as it went along, there were prophets who began to prophesy. And as the church started, there were tongues. And as the church started, there were signs. And there were miracles. And eventually these ceased, and they stopped. And then along came Paul... And yes, Paul did some of the miracles, but eventually those miracles ceased. And today, in the church age, the rapture's out here. There are no more tongues. There are no more miracles. There are no more signs. There's no more prophets. No more prophecies. This was a transition period, transi transitional period, that the early church started on. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the end of, of chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. It says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. I'm in verse 27. Verse 28, And God has set some in the church, first apostles, okay, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. And then it says, After that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps of government, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? No, there are no apostles to this day. All the apostles are gone. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? No. This is a, what is this one? Of miracles of, oh, healing. They were healing back here. Today, no one can lay hands on someone and heal them. Why is that? 1 Corinthians 1.22, 1 Corinthians 14.22. Let's look those verses up. We're here close anyway, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 14.22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So tongues are for a sign. So tongues are for a sign. So here's a sign. What is healing for? What were the tongues for? What are the miracles for? They were for sign to Israel. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22 says this. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So, as the church started, they were going to the Jews. Eventually the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and God went to the Gentiles with the method, message of the gospel. So tongues and prophesying and healings and signs and wonders, they ceased. They were no longer needed because the Jews as a nation rejected Jesus Christ. Today if a man comes and says he can heal you by laying hands on you, better watch out. Because the Antichrist over here, he comes in with all lying signs and wonders. 
the Bible says. So this early ministry of the apostles that was accompanied with this, that's all over. There are many verses I could go into to talk about that. Just don't have the time. But we do, and we looked at it in one of these teaching sessions about how in uh, 2 Timothy we read about how Paul left someone sick. Let's see if I can find that real quick. In, it's in 2 Timothy 4.20. 2 Timothy 4.20. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20, Paul is speaking. He says, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. At Miletum sick. Well, here we are out here, Paul, in 66 AD, end of his ministry. Paul says, I left a guy sick. Well, back here, when Paul was preaching, there were people that were sick, and Paul, he just had to have a handkerchief handkerchief. Well, I'll just put handkerchief. And he could pray over the handkerchief and heal them. So why did Paul leave someone sick out here? Because this changed, and it went from Jew to Gentile, and those signs were no longer needed. Now, there's a lot more I could go into on that, and there's not time. I've got to finish this. I've got to get to the end of this. So, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But it is important to note that tongues for a sign, and the signs are for Jews. And what was the miracle of tongues? The apostles stood up and spoke, and they heard in their own tongue the preaching of the gospel. Now to this day, tongues are a written, spoken language. And Paul talks to the church in Corinth and says, you have to have an interpreter present. There was no interpreter in Acts chapter 2 and 3. The miracle was the people listening heard the gospel in their own tongue. But here, tongues is a written, spoken language. I speak English and Spanish. Those are two tongues. And if I were to come to your church and preach in Spanish and you only spoke English, I'd have to have an interpreter that would interpret into English or else I would have to preach in English or else I'd have to keep silent. So that's the, the, the tongues. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now, this is an abused verse. I've heard people take this verse and says, well, it says prove all things. So I went out and drank a beer and tried it and got drunk. And I went out and tried cigarettes and proved it. And I decided not to hold fast because it wasn't good. Well, the verse isn't telling you to go sin. The verse is just saying as you study, as you look, as you see things, look and see what's good. Hold fast to that which is good, but that isn't. Reject it. It's not saying go try it. It's not a verse saying, well, try marijuana, and if you like it, hold fast. If not, don't. It's not telling you, go try it. It's just saying, prove it. Prove it if it's true. Look at it. Study it. Then it says, abstain, abstain from all appearance of evil. Most new versions of the Bible remove verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Why would someone want to take that, take that out of the Bible? I guess they don't want you to abstain from appearance of evil. It's, it's interesting how many verses, new versions, take out of the Bible. And they just say, oh, this whole verse doesn't need to be there. Scratch and take out, abstain from all appearance of evil. How odd. Now, this is verse 23, and this is what I wanted to get to. So let's look at verse 23. Um, I guess I'll have plenty of room over here to write this up. It says, verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? The rapture. All right, so the Bible here tells us three parts. He said, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body. Now, most people that teach this teaching, we say it the exact opposite. We say body, soul, spirit, body, soul, spirit. There are whole teachings on the internet. You can go to YouTube and they tell you about the body, soul, and spirit. But yet in this verse, God mentioned it backwards, the spirit, soul, and body. Why does the Bible mention it one way and then we as people turn it around and mention it the exact opposite? Well, think about it. We as people, we see the body first, so we say body, soul, and spirit. But God is a spirit and he's looking down, he sees the spirit and then the soul and the body. So it's interesting, the King James Bible says it backwards from the way we say it, but it says it correctly. God says the spirit first. He mentions spirit, soul, and body, because he sees the spirit and then the soul and the body. We see the other way around. Now, there are three parts to every person. 
And God is a trinity. He is a triune God. That is one God, three parts. So what you have, and I've seen it drawn like this before, and it's kind of interesting. Here's God. He's one God, but he has three parts. He's God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. You see this line here? The Son and the Holy Spirit aren't the same. They're different. The Son isn't the Father. The Holy Spirit isn't the Father. See the line there? But God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. It's one God with three parts. Now man also has three parts. And this is important because there's some denominations that teach man is a dichotomy. Man just has two parts, a body and a soul, and that's all. No, this verse says body, soul, and spirit. So, as we go to, to the scriptures, let's look at Genesis chapter 1. And uh, verse 27. Oh, no, verse 26. Here God is talking in the first chapter of the entire Bible, and look what he says. And God said, okay, so God's talking. God said, let me make man in my image. Is that what it says? If it's one God, he should have said, let me make man in my image. But he doesn't. He says, and I quote, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Why would God use the terms us and our? Those are plural. Well, because he's one God with three parts, and each part is distinct. God could actually separate those parts. But yet, God made us in his image. So, as God has three parts, we have three parts. What are our three parts? Body, soul, and spirit. And we can't separate ourselves like God. I don't know how he does that. Oh no, God made us in his image. So, as he has three parts, we have three parts. So, you have the three parts, and you have the soul which in Greek is psuxa, like psyche, where we get the word psyche. You have a body, soma, and you have a spirit. And the word in Greek is pneuma, like pneumatic. It has to do with, like, air. Now, I'm not going to write out the Greek or the Hebrew. It's, it's just a lot of work. You don't need to. But you look at a human being, they're like a football. I don't know if you've ever taken a football apart, if you ever tried to. But on the outside of a football... There is leather. Now if you take a football and you cut that leather away, inside that football is a bladder that's made of rubber. And inside that football is air. Now, if you take out that air, can you play with that football? No, it's flat, you can't throw it, nothing will work. If you take that bladder out, can you fill it up with air? No, it'll leak through the stitches. If you take off the leather around that bladder, can you play with it? No. It takes three parts. Now, is it three footballs or is it one football? It's one football with three different parts. You see, there's a lot of denominations out there that don't understand the Trinity. They can't get in their head that something can be one and three at the same time. God is one God with three parts. It's a football. It's one football, but it's made up of three parts. So... Us, what we are, we're like the football. The leather is like the body, our body. We have an outward body. The bladder is like our soul. That's what's inside of us. And when you die, the soul will either go to heaven or hell. And the air inside of it is like the spirit. Now, God, God the Father, is the soul of God. The Son came down in an earthly body. God the Son, Jesus Christ, took on a, a body of flesh but without sin. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. So we are made in the likeness of God and we have a body, soul, and spirit. And it's like this, what we're made of. So let me draw. I'm not a good artist once again. But here's a person. The body is the outward part. It is corrupt. It can die someday and it will die. When that body dies, that soul inside that body will come out and go to one of two places, either heaven or hell. So that soul will live for all eternity. And inside that soul, when you're born, there's nothing in there. Because Adam and Eve fell, they lost the Spirit of God. So everyone born is born with an empty spirit. 
That makes every human being ever born two-thirds of a person. And two-thirds in fractional form is 0 0.666. You say, not that number. Why is that? Well, Revelation 13, 18 says the number of man is the number of the beast. And it is three score, 300, uh, two score. Wait. <coughs> it's 666, whatever it says. So 666. So when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit of God that comes and dwells inside your spirit. And the Bible calls it a new creature. And that new creature melds with the soul. And this becomes a new creature. And the body is dead. The Bible says it's crucified with Christ. So when you die, how can you as a Christian go to hell? The Holy Spirit of God would have to go to hell. That's not going to happen. So what is it that takes your soul to heaven when you die? The Spirit. So the moment a person who's a Christian goes, uh, dies, their body immediately goes up. To heaven because the Spirit of God takes them there now here's a guy over here who's not saved he's got no spirit all he is is a body and a soul and the souls inside when he dies where does he go directly down here to hell because he's got nothing inside him to take him up and he'll spend eternity in hell where his soul will burn for all eternity. So that's what the teaching is of body, soul, and spirit. It has to do with the Trinity. God is a Trinity. He's three parts. He made us with three parts. But because Adam and Eve sinned, the Holy Spirit left. So we're born spiritually dead. When you're born again or you're saved, you're saved spiritually, but physically that body has to be made a, spirit, a, um, a glorified body. And that's what we're waiting for at the rapture. So let's go ahead and finish this chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens when Jesus comes at the rapture? We looked at that. That's called the redemption of our body. And that's when we get a glorified body. That's when we get a body like Christ when he rose from the dead. And then it says, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth who uh, calleth you who also will do it. Wow. That's eternal security. Faithful he that calleth you will also you do it. When he calls you and he saves you, there's no way you can lose your salvation. You are his. You're bought with a price. He took your soul. He moved into it. And that's his. It's a new creature. It's going to heaven no matter what. When you sin, you sin in the body. You're supposed to reckon the flesh dead and not follow the, the lust of the flesh. Now, verse 25, brethren, pray for us. 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. <laughs> this is a verse that very few people practice nowadays. But if you go to Europe, a lot of Europeans, they kiss each other. Uh, you even go to Honduras and, and Guatemala and places. Not the people, the common people that live outside the city, but a lot of city folks will come up and go and give you a kiss here and here. It's, it's the, the norm, the accepted way that they do it. Well, in the old days, they came up and gave each other holy kisses. Today, we don't do that, and thank God. <laughs> it's kind of easy. It would be too easy to get in the flesh for a lot of Christians to go kissing each other all the time. But usually, it's a kiss on the cheek. You remember when Judas came, he kissed Christ on the, on the cheek. So this is the holy kiss. It's a kiss that people that were family in the time of Jesus would usually kiss each other when they see each other or good friends. Now, verse 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Hmm. And then that means that every epistle that Paul wrote isn't just a written to that group. It's written to all the saints. So all saints should read the book as well. Let me give you an example. We're getting close to the end here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Okay? You can't just say that this epistle is written to that church and nobody else. Every epistle that he wrote to a church, Paul expected that it be read in other churches as well. There wasn't one gospel for one church and another gospel for another church. There wasn't one teaching and one doctrine for one church and one for another church that were different. It was the same gospel, the same doctrine for everyone. So, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother. Under the church of God which is at Corinth to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Now look at what it says. So, he, so clearly he's writing to the church of Corinth. But then it says with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours. 
So Paul was writing that to the church of Corinth and then to all the saints that call upon the Lord. That sounds like every Christian ever. <laughs> so we see how Paul was writing his epistles and how his epistles still apply to us today. So we're in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians was supposed to be read to the ones in Corinth. And Corinthians was supposed to be read to the ones in Thessalonica. And so they, they went around and wrote different ones and gave them out. Now here's something interesting. There are 66 books in the King James Bible. That's what God wanted for us, 66, which is interesting because 6 is the number of man. So God gave us a complete number, 66. But there's an epistle that was written that we don't have today that's been lost. Colossians 4.16 says, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Huh. Well, in Revelation 3.14, God writes the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Right. So there was an epistle that's missing. That was an epistle to the Laodiceans. wonder what that was. Maybe it's one of the ones we already have. It's just a different name. But there's something. There are books that are mentioned in the Bible that we don't have today. There's another passage that mentions the book of Jasher. Um, supposedly that book exists. Let me see if I can find that. Um, and I've seen people that sell it, but if you take that supposed book that people call the book of Jasher, it appears to have been messed with. Someone has changed passages and messed up. Joshua 13.9. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies, it says. Is, it, is not this written in the book of Jasher? Our King James Bible mentions the book of Jasher, but there's no book of Jasher in the Bible. 2 Samuel 1.18 says, Also he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Hmm. So there are other books in the, the, uh, that the Bible mentions but yet they're not in the canon. They're not in the King James Bible. So, uh, let's see. There's a book of Enoch also. The book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is an amazing book. Yet it has been messed with, it appears. I've read it before. It looks like there's four or five places where the Catholics have gone in and added to it something that goes against the rest of the teachings of the Bible. There's another book, the Epistle of Barnabas. Now the Epistle of Barnabas is supposedly the writing of Barnabas, the same Barnabas that worked with Paul. And there's something in the Epistle of Barnabas that I've read that's pretty amazing. Hebrew outright says that they with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years one day means that one day equals a thousand years. And that whole thousand year thing that we put out here, one of the teachings, it lines up with that. Now, do we take these books as doctrine? No. Are they part of the canon? Do we accept these books? No. God gave us, as we read earlier, a more sure word of prophecy. These are the 66 books that God chose for us. We can't take these other books as scripture. It doesn't mean we don't throw them out. You can read them if you want to, but I'm kind of scared to read them. I'm afraid I might get doctrine out of them and, and believe it for the rest of my life and think it was from the Bible when it was really from them. So I'd rather not read them. I try to stay away from those other readings of the, of the Bible. So the books that God gave us, the canon of the New Testament and the Old Testament together, is 66 books. And these are the books for us today. Now, the Catholic Church has other books, extra canonical books, books that they receive and believe are for them. And I think they have 73 books or something like that. But we don't. We take the 66 books of the King James Bible. So, verse 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The first epistle unto the Thessalonians, which was written from Athens. So there we are. We have finished 1 Thessalonians, finally. The first book, going verse by verse. I hope this has been a blessing to you. We will continue next time. And um, it's been a blessing to do this. I hope it's been a good study. If God has blessed you with this teaching, well, feel free to join us in the next one as we go through another book. So our next teaching will be verse by book, verse through the book of 2 Thessalonians. So thanks again. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope you were able to learn something. And so God bless, and thank you for your time.